you've been thinking about or pondering or, or have always thought in the back of your mind, why is it like this or why is it like that? We invite you to write it out, jot it down, drop it in the question box, and we will answer it. I think there were some questions that were dropped off and the pastor snuck out with them. And he had another appointment tonight, so he can't be here. So if you did write a question down, we're not ignoring it. We'll actually probably be answering it tomorrow. I just don't have the question, so I, I can't answer them without that. So will that pastor answer them tomorrow? He's back. Uh, but if you have any questions that pop up, uh, drop it in the box. A lot of people have been wondering, there's quite a bit of the Bible that we're not going over in these nine nights. You would agree, yes or no? Yes. There's quite a few topics that we're not able to do. And why is that? The first of which is we're not going to do a double header here at Dodge Town. Amen? Amen? So we're going to hold you to that 45 minutes or so of your time, and then we're going to let you go. Because of that, there are things in the Bible that we will not be able to go over. So we made a very conscious, 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 prayerful decision on what meetings to have during this. We thought it was very important for you to get to know your Savior, Jesus Christ, before some of the other things in the Bible. Now, it's not that some of those other things aren't important, so what we're going to do is we're going to alert you to something that will happen following, what is it? Following. following this series of meetings. We want those questions to be answered. We want to continue to go over them. So we're going to alert you to something that's going to happen following, but we're not going to announce it yet. So you're going to have to come back and find out how those questions are going to be answered. So there has been some questions, for instance, uh, why do people, some people go to wor worship on Sunday, and why do some people go to worship on Saturday? We want that question to be answered. There's been some questions on what exactly happens when you die. Did you know that the Bible gives a clear explanation of exactly what happens when you die? People have that question. And unfortunately, because of the time constraint, we won't answer them during this series of meetings. But there is hope those questions will be answered, and you'll be alerted to that uh, probably tomorrow and also on Saturday. Fair enough? Fair so enough. if you still have questions, put them in the box. Uh, don't be afraid. Let us have a word of prayer before we invite Stephanie up here. Blessed Father, Lord, we thank you for the day. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to learn more about you. Lord, tonight, uh, many of us have questions on our mind. And tonight, we're going to study the oldest, or the longest, rather, prophecy in the Bible. Lord, I just ask that as our questions are answered, that we would see a more full picture of who you are. We thank you for what you've done for us, and we thank you for giving us the opportunity to study the Bible. We pray these things in your precious name. to talk about the 2300 days in Daniel. And we're going to talk a little bit about the judgment too. Hopefully we won't spoil Justin's talk tomorrow night, but I think that you'll find that they will go hand in hand. So before uh, we get started, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to say another word of prayer for you. Heavenly Father, please send your spirit to be here. Thank you so much for bringing us here. I just, uh, I pray that you would give us um, Help us to focus, help us to have a clear understanding of what it is that you want to teach us to make. All right. Francis Fenelon, he was a court preacher for King Louis XIV in the 17th century in France. And one day, King Louis showed up to church in a cathedral, probably a lot like this one. And he showed up with his attendants, but there was something different about today. Nobody else was at church. It was just King Louis and his attendants. And he looked around and he said to his preacher, Fenelon, I said, what is the meaning of this? Where is everyone? And, and Fenelon said, your majesty, I sent out a notice that you wouldn't be at church today so that we could see who comes to truly worship God and who comes to impress you. That would be an interesting thing if we could do something like that today, wouldn't it? Hypocrisy as we know it, um, it, it really troubles a lot, of, a lot of Christians, doesn't it? It can be a stumbling block to people who are truly seeking God. And it certainly fuels attacks 
for opponents against Christianity, doesn't it? The word hypocrisy actually comes from the Greek word hypocrisis, which means the act of playing a part on stage. All right. There are many sincere believers who would love to just throw the phonies out, throw the hypocrites out, and just get on with spreading the gospel isn't there. But there's a little problem with that. And the problem is that we all have a little hypocrisy in our hearts. We all have those phony moments, don't we? But each day, God brings our inconsistencies before us, and he calls us to a deeper repentance and a truer commitment to him. We all love to hate a hypocrite every now and then, but we have to remember that there's a little bit of one in each of us. The process of refining our character, of polishing away compromise, it's a moment-by-moment, -moment, day by day experience in the life of a Christian. But what if some professed Christians resist the work of the Holy Spirit, and instead of engaging in soul cleansing, they cleanse the outside, even while, clo while cloaking secret sin? What if this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me? Does God care about hypocrisy, or does he look the other way? Let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. These are Jesus' words. Matthew 7, 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus is saying that not all professed believers are going to make it into heaven. Okay, he, he's adamantly against hypocrisy. There's a lot of examples of this from the Bible. And here are just some. We'll go through them quickly. They're in your outline that you'll get tonight as you leave. Giving to the poor to be recognized. Praying in public to be thought pious. Parading the fact that one is fasting to appear pious. Pointing out sin in others when one harbors even worse sin. Giving God lip service. Accusing others to look superior. Deceiving people away from a true knowledge of God. Oppressing the poor and vulnerable. Teaching proselytes to be hypocrites. Tithing but neglecting more important matters. Doing everything for show. Treating animals better than human beings. Being able to analyze the weather but not ethical matters. So the point is, God hates hypocrisy even more than any of us hate it. Now it's true that we're justified by faith alone, not by works. But the faith that justifies us, it's a working faith. The Bible's clear that works don't save us, but it's also clear that a faith-filled life is an obedient life. And obedience, the obedience that God is talking about is more than just a mechanical outward compliance to a set of rules. It's a spirit-led, group, ground-level harmony with the principles of God's law. And because spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, it's God himself that needs to judge us. Now, how does God do this? How does God judge his professed believers? God has a very systematic and organized system of accountability. And this system isn't just for non-believers, or it's not just for believers, it's for non-believers as well. It's for everyone. Often, so often, people, and I think each one of us have probably been in this situation, where we're just disgusted by people who hide behind the blood of Christ and think that, it gives them, that grace gives them license to sin. But that isn't the case, is it? So God has a system of accountability for believers. This system of accountability can also be known as the judgment. Now, when does this judgment take place? There are three passages in Scripture that we're going to look at that will help give us a little timeline. Let's start with Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24 and verse 24. And verses 24 and 25. Acts chapter 24, verse 24 and 25. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul 
and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. So the key we're looking at here is in verse, 20, verse 25 where it says, The judgment to come. So from this we can derive that this judgment has to take place after Jesus' first coming, after he was here and died. Because Paul is saying this after Jesus had been on earth and he said it was still to come. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's look at our second passage, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And we will read verses 6 and 7. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea, and the springs of water. So notice in this passage, in verse 7, it says that God's judgment has come during the proclamation of this message. So this means that the judgment is taking place in the end times. Does that make sense? Okay, let's look at our third passage. Just go uh, forward just a few more chapters to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Okay, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12, it says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. So when Jesus comes the second time, he says he's going to have a reward for everyone. So each person's cases have to be finished, have to be solved. Does that make sense? Okay, so from this passage we can say that the judgment has to happen and be completed before the second coming of Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have it all here. The judgment of the saints occurs after Jesus' first coming, during the end times, and before Jesus' second coming. All right. How does this judgment work? Now, remember, in any court of law, there's two phases of judgment. There's the investigative and the executive. So you've got your defense and prosecuting attorneys, and they both present their evidence and their arguments to a jury. The jury investigates all of that information, and they decide on a verdict, and they deliver that verdict to a judge, who then reads that verdict, which has already been decided. Okay, so God's final pronouncement upon the saints, or his reward, comes at his second coming. This means that the judgment that precedes this is investigative. So we are now living in the investigative judgment. Okay, where is this investigative judgment taking place? In order to answer that question, we need to go to the earthly sanctuary that was built during Moses' time. And this earthly sanctuary was patterned after God's heavenly sanctuary, and it served as a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. God wanted his people to know what his dwelling place looked like and what his activities were there. Okay, so where is Jesus now, and what is he doing? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Where is Jesus now, and what is he doing? Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Are we there? Almost. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. It says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected, and not man. Okay, so where is Jesus? 